Uh, thank you, uh, Alan, uh, uh, Wisdom, and Nadia for the, for, the, for the presentation. So I'll try to be a more general, uh, picking on the specifications that I would like to discuss. The first one that uh, obviously have kept coming uh, when we discuss the issue of natural resources, the issue of uh, governance and management of uh, public expectations. Whenever you have uh, discoveries, uh, such as the case in Tanzania now, where we, we, we have about 55, uh, 50, between 53 and 55 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. It is large in size, as, as Alan already pointed out, but not very large. Um, the simulated numbers uh, now tell us uh, could expect a, a revenue uh, ranging between 1.2 billion to $5 billion uh, a, a month. But this is uh, only 2 to 3% of, of GDP, so it's not very significant. Um, in a recent study, uh, when we asked people what would they want to see this uh, revenue from gas being used? Uh, they say, a majority of them are saying they expect it to be spent on, they want it to be spent on uh, health and education. That shows, of course, how disparate people are in terms of getting the final outcomes. But of course, there are some dangers of uh, spending resource rents on, uh, on social services in particular. I think uh, recently Ghana has had an experience where uh, you raise uh, spending on the social sector and eventually when oil prices go down, your budget deficit expands quite dramatically and then you are in serious uh, trouble. So we really have to be careful how we manage expectation. Uh, so I think uh, what I would propose is uh, all the governments in developing countries with abundant natural resources need not to lose sight of the importance of other sectors that are key to driving uh, transformation. I think transformation has been a key word uh, today since morning. So there are important sectors like agriculture, tourism. Uh, so the natural resources can be used to leverage, to the bottleneck those sectors uh, in order for them to the drive the growth process. It's equally important to strengthen transform, uh, transparency and public communication, which is much more important when you have discoveries than, than, than before, because you want to manage that perception that we need more money spent uh, on particular sectors. The second point I would want to, of course, uh, stress is, is the importance of uh, linking the macroeconomic framework uh, and the public ma financial management in the context of the uh, large resource boom, meaning you must keep uh, efforts to collect revenue from non-resource sectors, uh, and of course to direct public investments to those uh, public goods that will help the bottleneck the economy, so that uh, other sectors can can flourish uh, and grow. Um, there's this issue of uh, integrating natural resources in uh, into other sectors of the economy, but both. All the three presenters have, uh, have, have touched about, uh, on it because the, the, the most impact, the most benefit would be derived usually from, um, uh, from down, downstream supply industries in terms of generating employment, not the direct employment that uh, provides larger impact. And the, and the use of natural resources, for example, currently Tanzania is using, we're generating almost 60% uh, of power uh, from natural gas, but obviously the the gas that was discovered in, uh, uh, in the shallow uh, wells on shore. Uh, of course, we would expect more employment to be generated from industries such as petrochemical industries. So here we have to make a trade-off between using natural gas, a significant part of natural gas as feedstock, vis-a-vis uh, -vis revenue from exports. Now here the prices uh, will matter. It's a big challenge in Tanzania, for example, because the, most of the natural gas that has been discovered is actually dry gas. A lot of other countries, uh, especially in the Middle East, using gas as feedstock is an associated gas, uh, where you have already recovered most of your investment cost from oil, and then you use the associated cost at a close to zero price uh, to produce fertilizer, and petrochemicals, and, and, and others. 
Another important point that I would like to emphasize, uh, which was already uh, discussed even in the morning, is the, the issues of capacity, national capacity of institutions, which is very, very key, as well as skills of individuals working in the oil and gas sector, but also other associated industries. That's the reason that uh, the countries like uh, Norway managed to escape uh, uh, natural resource gas because the institutions were already uh, in place at the time of uh, discoveries uh, of uh, oil and gas, unlike many other developing countries where, whose institutions are still uh, nascent. I think here is where we need to really, really, really put more <coughs> efforts. The gold is actually a, a very capital intensive industry. I've visited some of the gold mines in Tanzania. Um, the massive imports of uh, specialized machinery, which you can only use in this sector. You cannot use those dampers in any, even in construction industry, and they are very expensive. Um, and the, you see limited relations between this large-scale mining and the artisanal mining. So the technology transfer, technology upgrading, upgrading of artisanal mining is not very uh, significant. So we really need to see how we can link these two. Uh, and the waste product that is produced in the mines, out of almost uh, one ton of earth moved, uh, the optimal production was about nine, nine to 12 ounces or grams out of a ton of earth moved. And you cannot use that all oh, for anything. So it's a very, very uh, high cost industry that produces limited uh, 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 secondary use of its materials. You can only, the, the, so the key benefits are derived from royalty revenue, which you have to optimize and make sure that you have very good contracts, uh, corporate tax, but we see significant problems of uh, exemptions, multiple exemptions that uh, limits, erodes the, the revenue base. Uh, and of course, even the domestic supply industry is limited to supply of food and, and some, some supplies, uh, but mainly a good part of these uh, equipments and materials like cyanide are all imported, that is used in the, um, in the industry. Uh, finally, because I have only one minute left, uh, uh, I would like to underscore the point that uh, 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 Wisdom has raised. That the attention on, 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 on renewable resources, uh, fisheries, forestry, uh, is quite low. And yet, these uh, natural resources provide significant potential to, uh, to generate revenue, to create employment, and to support industrial transformation. We have seen a lot of, uh, of, uh, of African countries, including Tanzania, exporting logs um, uh, rather than exporting finished products so, so, that, so we could develop industrial base locally uh, to manufacture wood products rather than to export logs. So I think uh, we should not leave some of these fact sectors as, as, as marginal sector for small scale fishermen, uh, but we have to integrate them with the large scale fish, fish fishers and make sure that there is substantial domestic value addition uh, if these sectors are to contribute to structural transformation. I think I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Donal. Uh, we'll now open the floor for questions. Uh, I'll be starting with this side. If you have questions, we'll go to the first round. Uh, yes, please. Uh, the microphone is coming. Okay. I'm Henry Jacoby from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <clears throat> I have a question for, for Alan Rowe, and I alert you, this is a, this is a voice from another silo, <laughs> from, from, the, from the climate side. The only mention of climate in your discussion was on the demand side, uh, influencing total <laughs> demand for resources. But I want to just ask you about what you think might be the impl implication of what's going on, the, on, the, on the climate negotiations for, for, uh, for the finance of the things that you're talking about. As you know, in the US and a lot of other countries, there's a lot of pressure against the building of ports, pipelines, uh, it, it development of resources. And in the, in the international negotiations it, going into Paris, there's a lot of discussion about finance and it directing finance, both ODA, uh, Overseas Development Assistance, and even foreign direct assistance. It's just into, into, into greenhouse gas reducing technologies. And I just wonder, do you think that the, those kinds of pressures are likely to influence 
the ability of the availability of the ODA and the FDI that are going to be needed for the, your your vision of development in the in Africa. Uh, thank you. Uh, just behind you, lady. Uh, thank you, the panelists, uh, for the wonderful presentations. Uh, this can go to anybody on the panel. Right now, Africa, we are under UNEP. We are being told to switch Africa green. Green growth, green growth, green growth. Uh, and in, in actual sense, the arguments we put across as policymakers to the economic actors, they will say, why are you encouraging us to go green? In actual sense, we also need to emit to, to grow. So what are the incentive structures are we trying to put in place to encourage our policymakers, not only policymakers, but the actual actors on ground to go green for renewable resources? Because right now we're trying to advocate for low emissions, but it's not really working. It's not working to the, the issue for industrialization because they're saying we're not making any profit in this way. So we need to think outside the box as we're trying to advocate for the low emissions issues, for green growth aspects. So what kind of issues can you really advise us to put on ground for industrialization when the actual guys are saying we need to also emit to grow? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so one last question here for this side. Please identify yourself. I'm Sean Bo Nielsen from uh, Copenhagen Business School. Uh, I've tried to uh, read quite a bit about uh, the taxation of uh, uh, resource exploitation and I'm getting quite confused because there seems to be a theoretical uh, recommendation in the direction of resource rent tax and I didn't hear anything about a resource rent tax in, in the discussion so far. Uh, uh, but there seems to be a theoretical recommendation there. But then my own feeling is that when you are up against multinational co corporations uh, which can uh, engage in transfer pricing, then you should be very careful about that kind of tax and maybe you want to fall back to uh, royalties. Do you have any comments on that? The first two speakers. Okay, thank you. So we'll have answers before proceeding to another round of questions. Okay, uh, I think uh, one question uh, was kind of directed to me, the green growth question, right? So maybe I'll just uh, try to answer that one. Uh, yeah, it is true that currently uh, Africa may not be emitting much uh, compared to uh, the, the other countries or the, the other continents, uh, but we know that uh, there are signs that Africa is, is doing well, things are improving, and over time, uh, the levels of pollution that will be experienced will be uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, and it has implications not only for uh, the developed world, but for Africa itself, because uh, there are studies indicating that the impact of pollution, which will alter the climate, uh, will be much harsher on Africa than other continents. So it is very important that we may not see benefits today from cutting down on emission or taking the low carbon path today, but if we continue with the business as usual, uh, in some time to come, the repercussions are going to be much, much harsher on, on, on the continent. So that is the, the reason why we have to do something about uh, uh, emissions today on the continent. And I also like to mention that uh, perhaps green growth is also a little bit more general than looking at uh, low carbon development paths. Uh, we can think of green growth in, uh, in fisheries as well. It's just uh, in fisheries, the, in the implication here will be uh, extracting on a path that guarantees sustainability, that a future generation will also be able to get enough fish just like you catch today and generate the highest revenue from fisheries. If you invest too much effort today and catch too much today, then tomorrow you are going to lose out. So you may have a higher revenue today, but if you look at the benefits over time, if you look at the stream of benefit, the best option, the best strategy will be to, to harvest at a level that will guarantee that uh, from time to time uh, you obtain a certain level of benefit, which on, on the aggregate is higher than any other path that you might, uh, that, that, that you could take. Thank you.
I'll connect here. Um, if I can just build on, on what Wisdom has said. Um, you know, it seems to me that whatever is said in Paris in a few weeks' time, that there will be some recognition that countries uh, such as Tanzania, where, for, the, for example, only 18% have access to electricity currently, will have a right in the, in the foreseeable future to build um, power generation capacity. Um, in the case of Tanzania, that what is being built currently is going to be gas-fired. Um, because it's being built in 2015, 2016, it's going to be not, I won't say state-of-the-art as it would be in the United States, but it will, it will, be rec it will recognize the need uh, to, be, to limit pollution to the extent that is, is possible. But I don't actually see that there's any real prospect that either the natural gas development that is uh, being dis discussed at the present time or it's already taken place, or indeed the financing from donor agencies and others for the power generation is going to be unduly affected by the, the global um, climate change discussions in a very, very poor country. It's small, it's, most people would sort of say it's, it's insignificant in terms of the, the global uh, impact. And I, uh, sorry? Coal. Coal, uh, I, I know there's talk about developing coal further. Chinese have invested a great deal in new coal facilities in, uh, um, in Tanzania, but the immediate sort of boost to power generation is going to come from gas-fired generation. Uh, I, I plead ignorance on how long it will take before the coal, if at all, becomes a source of, of fuel. Um, shall I take the, uh, Dr. Nielsen's question? Yeah. Um, Taxation is a complicated matter. I intentionally stayed off it because uh, uh, it, it could take a whole uh, seminar on its own. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion about the way in which uh, these minerals are taxed. There's a big difference, for example, between oil and gas versus, versus minerals. Um, oil and gas is typically taxed on production sharing agreements, whereby you know, from the, the first day there's any production at all, um, depending on the agreement, the government is getting a right to the real, a share of the real resource. Uh, transfer pricing, you know, doesn't enter into that picture very much. The, the issue is how, how the government concerned or the national oil company, if that is the source of where the revenue goes, this revenue goes, depends to, to use that, that, that resource. I think, uh, I think Wisdom also referred to royalties being too low, but I think um, we, when we look at taxation of minerals even, we, we can't just look at royalties. We need to look at the totality of the taxation. And the way that we've done it in the case studies we've done is to look at the sort of accumulation of taxes of all sorts, the PAYE on employees. Don't forget the employees of mining companies um, are extremely well paid and they pay a lot of uh, PAYE um, tax. There's import duties on some, some things. There are local, local license fees and levies. Um, there's corporation tax, admittedly after a a lag because the depreciation allowances persist for seven or eight years, and then there are royalties. And to say that royalties are only 5% of the revenue is, I think, uh, only telling part of the story. I mean, the cases we've looked at, um, where you take the, the gross turnover of a, mining, a typical mining company, whether it's in Ghana or in, in Tanzania, is that for, for every, every 100, something like 15 of that goes to government. About 65 is employers' salaries and payments and other inputs some of which will be imported. About 7% uh, goes to shareholders, and the rest goes to depreciation. So the government is typically getting sort of 15% of the gross figure, which is a very, can be a very high proportion of profit, because uh, in the early stages, and this is true of um, the new oil and gas, so, no, sorry, the new gas investments in Tanzania, in the first 10 years of production, the profits will be negligible. So if, as far as the government's getting any revenue, it's getting from, from these other taxes, and these are the ones we need to concern ourselves with. Of course, in mining systems where you have a royalty, on day one from production, if it's a production-based royalty, you'll get, you'll get the royalty revenue, which may only be 5%, um, which may not seem a lot, but in, in the context where the, the 100, 65 or 70 of that is paid on wages, salaries, and other inputs, you know, it's, a, it's a large proportion of the residual 30% that's available to do other things. Um, so I don't think we can discount transfer pricing. I know it exists, and there's a lot of work done to try to close the doors. But I don't think it's quite such a big and dominant issue uh, for at least well-run mining companies, as, as is sometimes suggested. 
for the sake of time, we'll take the second round of questions on this side. Uh, yes, please. One, two, and three. Yeah. <clears throat> well, my first um, observation is the comparison between renewable and non-renewable resources. And it seems to me that the last two speakers, particularly <coughs> the, the last one, um, Wisdom, um, gave an excellent review of how the value of natural resources should actually be compared with the alternative of uh, destroying an area uh, for the sake of chasing after non-renewable resources like gold. And the missing element here was that it seems to me that in, um, in the first speaker uh, presentation, Alan Rowe, um, there were estimations given of the value of these various uh, mineral resources, but there was no, um, nothing to show how much is lost in minus uh, when you exploit the area and you lose your natural resources. Not, not to mention, of course, the fact that people are displaced, um, water supply might be reduced, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, agricultural production diminishes, and there are lots of social problems and unrest. Um, so that's a rather important question, the matter of whether you, you do exploit your, your non-renewable resources or do not exploit it, particularly in terms of its, of its profitability in even the not very long term. Okay, that's one point. Um, the other aspect uh, that comes here is fine. You make a revenue from exploiting your non-renewable resources. And the big question in the developing world is who takes this revenue? Right? It is well known, 101 examples, where it's an elite who swallow the revenue and deposit all the money in the Western banks. Now, how good is that for the developing population in the, the third world? Zero <laughs> almost. I can give you a classic example of the small little state of Goa in India where billions over the decades have been siphoned off a lot from illegal mining uh, and selling the low quality ore to various countries, particularly to China. Uh, and the, the state itself is relatively better developed than the other parts of India, but could have been a, a, a new Switzerland if all that money was invested in the development of this little tiny state of Goa which has other resources such as tourism and so on. So these are the sort of relating um, aspects which come in. And then the question of final question is the amount of revenue. Now Goa was compared with Norway in one study and it was found that unlike Norway, where Norway was able to obtain uh, through ownership of her natural oil resources, something like 70, 80 or whatever percent for, for the Norwegian state, Goa didn't manage even three to five percent. Everything else went to illegal mines, to um, elite in the, in the country and elsewhere, and foreign companies. So that's the reality. Thanks for the comments. We'll take the second and third questions. Please try to be brief and concise for the sake of time. Good afternoon, everybody. And first of all, I want to say to everybody, happy birthday to the Institute, which has invited us and uh, give us place for the sharing our view and uh, learn about the options, what we have for our next 15 or 30 years for our child as well. And uh, um, my question is about the um, natural resources um, uh, usage. Okay, here we discuss about the taxes, about the uh, feasibilities or, I mean, um, efficiency of using the um, um, uh, different mineral resources, but nobody mentioned it about the social protection and study in the social protection, especially, for example, uh, we all of know that it's gold mining or oil and gas sector, it's uh, consumed so many energy. And this, it's companies, uh, um, the, 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 the 
instead of the produce the energy, they just compute the energy which is, should link or should go to the population for the family's needs, for the uh, females developed, for the child developed as well. So as an institute, it's a UN institute who is looking for the um, development of the, um, the nations, uh, each nations. The question, um, do the any um, I, I don't know department sectors or researchers is studied the, um, the the social responsibilities of the coal mining, uh, oil and gas mining, to construct uh, the, um, uh, the the power generation uh, facilities, network facilities for the growing the population in the area where they use the resources, and this is a great first question and second just the comments. And uh, nobody, and I, I'm really glad to see that females on the panel of the men's, and this is exactly show the efficiency of the research, because the females thinking from the, uh, and finding the new ideas to support to the development. And uh, um, and maybe it's, uh, we need to see for the, this kind of issue from the different perspective with different eyes, and find the point of development from the nation, the, the, the development of nation instead of the development of the natural resources. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the last question. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm GB Cham from Bonn University in Germany. Uh, this question is addressed to uh, wisdom uh, in your presentation, Wisdom, uh, you mentioned, for instance, uh, the need to have a kind of incentives that will, you know, bring uh, the use of uh, natural resources from the second best to the first best solution. I was just thinking, uh, I, I wanted to get your thoughts in terms of, uh, do you think we can use a different instrument rather than taxing uh, natural resources because, uh, well, the, the model uh, was very fast to me, but if your tax is based on uh, the level of effort that people can provide, you know, uh, I, I, we can also think about different other options that may lead to the second uh, best option, especially in a context where uh, we know uh, on, on the one hand, we can increase, we can enhance the revenue we collect from, you know, protecting the use of the natural resources, but also on the, on the other hand, uh, strengthening the capacity of the developing countries to uh, uh, increase the ability to control uh, the use of, of the resource, right? And the other question is addressed to Alan. You showed a very nice figure uh, displaying the gap, for instance, between the revenue that we get mm -hmm. from the resource, but also uh, the expected uh, expenses we ha developing countries have, for instance, to engage in terms of health or education. I was just thinking about maybe whether you uh, factored in uncertainties that may arise from, you know, the, this variability in terms of the pricing of the natural resources, because definitely this gap may change according to whether you know the price has increased or yes. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I'll ask each panelist to pick up one question and answer as quickly as possible. Maybe the question on. Um, energy consumption on uh, mine seat or natural resources, ex extractive uh, industry uh, area. I would say, uh, yeah, energy consumption must be also a study like water or land consumption because uh, it's come to competition with um, uh, uh, population usage of, of energy and uh, the social responsibilities uh, in the in, in, uh, extractive industry area, how to, to, to overcome the negative impact of industrial, of in, um, 
of uh, not, um, extractive industry on populations. Um, I think we have some people here at WIDER who uh, uh, look at uh, this side of, of, of the issues re related to natural resources too. So, uh, I mean, you raise a good point. Uh, we should have mentioned um, effectively that uh, energy consumption came into, into competition with uh, uh, mining activities as well as water or land. And yes, social responsibilities is quite important and uh, some research working on that here at WIDER. Sorry? And or obligated the, 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 the gold mining company mm -hmm. to, to be to construct, to, to invest to the generation capacity and network system to support, which support for development of the region where they will work. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, maybe at the end of uh, you and me. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the question regarding uh, the incentives, whether we can have other policy uh, instruments that could work. Uh, I, I would like to say that it's very, very difficult uh, to design policies uh, for fisheries management in developing countries uh, for many, many, many reasons. Uh, uh, one policy that has been tried is granting territorial use rights to communities where a community living by the, the fishery will have uh, the right over the resource within the area. But fisheries are migratory. You know, if you are managing maybe a common grazing area, you can just allocate it and each community will have a patch. But if it is a resource that migrate, then even if this community is doing the right thing, uh, the fishes could go to the other communities and be harvested. So that is very difficult to, to do. And then uh, uh, also there have been situations where we have also had co-management where the government together with the community come together to uh, have a common understanding on how the resource is supposed to be managed. But the governments or, or pol uh, policy makers from the government side don't have good, I mean, that much credibility with communities. Uh, and it, it, it has a history. I mean, there has been a situation where uh, at some point in time, uh, a judge uh, told fishermen uh, who took a case there against other fishermen uh, who were fishing uh, with destructive fishing equipment, that the best fisherman is the one that catches more fish. So if you have such contradictory uh, uh, statements coming from people who are supposed to help to manage the stock, then it's now difficult for the same people to come to the communities and be asking them to dialogue on how the stock is going to be managed. So uh, so, so it, it's, it's not very easy to come out with uh, uh, other policies. So uh, for now, I think, uh, devising a tax structure uh, that will uh, uh, will be a tax on inputs uh, like premixed fuel seems like uh, a viable option for now. Um, the chairs asked me to be almost uh, brief to the point of disappearing, um, so I apologise to the gentleman in the back, but I'm, I'm very happy, sir, to just talk to you in the coffee break, give you a more complete answer. I think the answer is really. Of course, there are many, many examples of very bad practice of the type you, you quote, both in terms of revenue management and in terms of the um, treatment of local peoples. But there are increasingly a huge wedge of international standards, which uh, 21 companies, which are 70% of world production, adhere to because they are committed to them through the organizations to which they be, uh, uh, engage. There's also things like extractive industries from transparency, which is dealing with some of the problems of the type you mentioned. Go, go over. Let's talk about it in a little more detail because the chairman is going to kill me otherwise. <laughs> well, uh, thank you everybody for your patience. Uh, just before closing, I simply wanted to point out that uh, you and you wider as embark on an important project on natural resource management. So you should definitely keep vigil of future opportunities for research collaboration in that field. Again, thanks a lot for your patience. We went uh, beyond the allocated time. You still have some time to grab some coffee. So thank you and
We are back and close the session.